All right, well, come on in. And um, why don't we uh, take our Bibles and open them to Revelation 12. And as folks are filing in, uh, just a quick announcement. Um, 11 a.m. this Friday morning at the Sweetwater Country Club. There's going to be uh, 18 local candidates filling all kinds of uh, elective positions. So this is kind of a chance to hear from them and uh, ask them questions and those kind of things. Lots of contested races, so this would be a good one to attend if you could. And um, early voting starts in about uh, three weeks. So if you want to know who's running for what office, um, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to go to Friday morning, 11 a.m., Sweetwater Country Club. Did I catch it all, Joe? Okay, good. So politics is sort of a way to uh, extend uh, common grace to the culture. Amen? Uh, I kind of look at politics like stewardship. You know, God gives us a lot of things to be stewards over, and one of the things we have is freedom to pick our rulers. I don't think they have that in Saudi Arabia. So we've got some uh, privileges that other countries don't have, so it's always good to figure out who's running for what and what folks stand for. Amen? Because the Bible says if the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. And I think we do a lot of groaning sometimes because we don't uh, show up and make well-informed decisions on the voting place. Amen. Anyway, enough of that. Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Revelation, if we could. Uh, Chapter 12. And uh, if you've been tracking along with us uh, in this study, we uh, are talking about what does the Bible say about the kingdom. And we've sort of traced, you know, uh, all the way through the Old Testament, right up to the life of Christ, the, the concept of the kingdom and how it was offered to Israel on a silver platter. And then the kingdom was turned down in Matthew 12, as you know. God, at that point, began an interim work uh, that we're part of, but it's not the kingdom. And uh, one of these days, this interim work uh, called the church will be over. The earthly mission of the church will be over. The church will be raptured to heaven. And the kingdom is going to be re-extended to Israel, and it's going to come to the earth. So we're sort of in that part of the study, uh, number, number 13, 14, and really 15 of that list there, uh, kind of explaining what God is going to do once the church is translated to heaven and how he's going to bring his kingdom to the earth. So to help us understand that, uh, We started uh, a lesson last week called The Coming of the Kingdom. And the coming of the kingdom has four parts to it. Number one, the reoffer of the kingdom to Israel. Number two, the transfer of earthly authority from Satan's domain to God's domain. And then number three, the establishment of the kingdom. And then finally, um, the, end, the end of this is the duration of the kingdom. I mean, exactly how long is the kingdom going to last? So we began last time, I think we completed, talking about the reoffer of the kingdom. So you'll recall in uh, the Gospels, the kingdom was offered by John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the Twelve, and the Seventy to Israel. Through the expression, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
So it was right there within their grasp and they could have had it had they enthroned Christ on Christ's terms. I don't have an underline there, but you notice verse 6, it's, uh, the instructions were, as this offer was extended, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this was a unique opportunity for Israel to receive the offer of the kingdom. And as we have studied, that offer is rejected in Matthew 12, 24, verse 24, which is the hinge verse, changes the whole direction of everything in Matthew's gospel. Uh, when the religious leaders attributed Christ's miracles to the devil, the moment they, they went that far, the offer is removed, as we have studied. And God today is working in an, in an interim program called the church, but it's not to be confused with Israel or the kingdom, as we've studied. But one of these days, the earthly mission of the church will be over, the bride will be made complete, the translation of the church will occur, and the offer of the kingdom, sometimes called the gospel of the kingdom, will be re-extended to Israel. At which time the nation of Israel will, will get it right and will receive the offer of the kingdom. Because one of the things you learn about the nation of Israel is Israel always gets it right which time around? Second time, good. And you can see, you know, here's a few examples I gave last week. Well, I don't want to re redo the examples I gave last week. Here's a few more I thought of just to solidify this point. Uh, you take the first king of Israel, uh, a guy named Saul. I mean, that's who the nation of Israel wanted. And I think they enthroned the wrong guy because Saul was from, from which tribe? Anybody know? He was from Benjamin, and the kings, according to Genesis 49 and verse 10, are supposed to come from which tribe? Judah. So, you know, if they had waited on the Lord, uh, instead of enthroning Saul, they could have had David, who was the right man for the job. So they got it wrong the first time with Saul, but they got it right the second time with David. So that's just another example of how Israel, you know, typically gets it right the second time. And, of course, as I was thinking about that, I'm, I'm reminded of the prophet uh, Jonah. Have you studied the Jonah lately? There is a, uh, let's see if I can even find Jonah in my Bible. Can someone locate Jonah 3, 1? I've got all these nice tabs in here too and I still can't find it. Uh, anybody have Jonah? Yeah, can you read that? <laughs> the word of the Lord came to Jonah this, a second time. So the first two chapters of the book, he is told to preach to Nineveh and he goes the opposite way to Spain. So God sort of has a way of getting his attention, like he does all of us. And so Jonah, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So chapters 1 and 2, in a four-chapter book, he gets it wrong. Chapters 3 and 4, he gets it right. So Jonah is sort of a type of the whole nation. They get it right the second time. So, and that's how it was uh, with the generation coming out of Egypt, they got to the border of Kadesh Barnea and they became fearful because of the giants. They fell into fear. But the next generation under Joshua entered the land with great courage. So there's another example where they got it right the second time. And Stephen, in his speech that got him executed, brings this up and he uses Moses, the acceptance of Moses by the nation as an example. And he also uses the, uh, the brothers, uh, the nation's acceptance of Joseph as an example. So there it all is. You put all these Old Testament verses together, whether it be Joseph, um, 
Saul, David, uh, Moses, the Kadesh Barnea generation, Jonah. I mean, it's, it's the same pattern. They get it right the second time, never the first time. So that would, if that type is true, it would work its way out prophetically, wouldn't it? The nation in the first century had a golden opportunity to enthrone Christ and receive the kingdom. They rejected it. But they're going to get it right the second time in the tribulation period. See that? So it's interesting how God is kind of tying together all this typology uh, in the end times. So they're going to receive the offer of the kingdom this time. And what will happen is the, taking us to number two here, the transfer of earthly authority. So the world, as we talked about last time, is under satanic bondage. It's been under satanic bondage ever since Genesis 3. Satan, as we talked about, is the the god of this age, the god of this world. And that's the significance of Jesus taking in Revelation 5 and opening the seven-sealed scroll. And I think we walked through a little bit of that last time, didn't we? The seven-sealed scroll is the title deed to the earth. And once that is opened, essentially what's happening is the title deed to the earth is being reclaimed. And this is all commensurate with God's instrument that he's using to accomplish all of these things, the nation of Israel, who, in the tribulation itself, is receiving the offer of the kingdom and getting it right a second time. So one of the things that's very interesting to study in the book of Revelation is how the judgments in the book of Revelation mirror the judgments in the book of Exodus. Have you ever noticed that? For example, we have sores in the sixth plague in the book of Exodus, and sores break out on people in the first bull judgment in the book of Revelation. Rivers to blood, that's in the first plague in the book of Exodus, and rivers to blood occur in the third bull judgment in the book of Revelation. Darkness, that occurs in the ninth plague uh, in the book of Exodus, and that is the fifth bowl judgment in the book of Revelation. Hail, that's the seventh plague in the book of Exodus, and it's also the seventh bowl judgment in the book of Revelation. So as you go through the book of Revelation, I mean, you should be kind of slapping your forehead and saying, gosh, I've read, I've read all this before. And um, if you go down to Revelation 16, uh, verse 14, actually verse 13, it says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like what? Frogs. Does that sound like the book of Exodus at all? where God multiplied frogs all over Egypt. So one of the interesting questions is why is it that the book of Revelation looks so similar to the book of Exodus? Why did the ten plagues in Exodus look so similar to the various judgments in the book of Revelation? And I think what's the reason for these parallels is that in the book of Exodus, God is taking his people out of 400 years of bondage. They had been in captivity in Egypt for 400 years, which is a long time. That's the length of the United States of America times two, you know, roughly. So in the book of Revelation, what is happening is God is taking the whole planet out of the bondage or the chains that it's been in ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden and ever since Satan became the prince and power of the air and the god of this age. I think that's why these parallels are here. 
So Pharaoh in the book of Exodus is a type, if you will, of Satan. Every time uh, a plague came in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh's grip over God's chosen people got weaker and weaker and weaker. You know, Pharaoh kept hardening his heart against God. And his, his will got weaker and weaker and weaker because he was being defeated by these plagues. And finally, when the firstborn all over Egypt were killed, including his own firstborn, and by the way, the Egyptians worshipped the firstborn. That's why that plague was so horrendous. Because God was showing that he's higher than whatever it is they're worshipping. By the way, they also worship gnats, and they also worship frogs, and they also worship the Nile River. So through each plague in the book of Exodus, God is showing his sovereignty over all the things that they worshipped uh, in Egypt. So by the time you get to plague 10, Pharaoh's will is, is broken, and he finally makes a decision to let Israel go. And so, in essence, as this scroll is being opened, every time Christ pulls back a seal and unscrolls, unwraps this scroll that's given in the book of uh, Revelation, Revelation 5, the title deed to the earth is being reclaimed, and Satan's grip over this world that he's enjoyed for all of these millennia is growing weaker and weaker and weaker. You see that? So Pharaoh, to a large extent, is a type of Satan, just as these Exodus judgments are types of the liberation that God is going to take the whole world through in the events of, of the book of Revelation. So people say, well, do you, do you take the judgments in the book of Revelation literally? Well, let me ask you a question. Were the judgments in the book of Exodus literal? Of course they were. So they're actually geophysical judgments. These are real things that happened. So why wouldn't I take the book of Revelation the exact same way, given the parallels? You see that? And something else that's sort of interesting is God, in the book of Exodus, keeps turning up the thermostat. The judgments keep getting more and more intense, more and more severe. I think that's Christ's point in Matthew 24, where he analogizes these birth pangs that I actually think are the seal judgments to pregnancy. As they grow in intensity and frequency, you know that the birth is near. So as you go through the book of Revelation, as these judgments grow in intensity and frequency, you know that birth is near. Birth of what? Birth of the kingdom, where God's rule is manifested over planet Earth, and Satan's grip is released from planet Earth. So the judgments in Revelation are literal, just like they are in the book of Exodus, and the judgments in Revelation grow in intensity and frequency, just like they did in the book of Exodus. God just kept turning up the heat, you know, to the point where um, uh, Pharaoh finally let Israel go. And that's how it's going to work in the book of Revelation, where Satan is finally going to release his grip over this earth. So that's kind of an interesting parallel, isn't it? And it's interesting, you go through commentators on the book of Revelation, and a lot of them don't really acknowledge that point. I've, I've found very few commentators explaining the similarities with the Exodus judgments. So one of the things to understand about this seven-sealed scroll is the seventh seal will unleash the trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet judgment will unleash the bowls. So the whole thing kind of pulls out like a telescope, if you will. Every time you reach a seventh uh, in the series, um, a new set of judgments is taking place. A new set of judgments is beginning. So by the time Christ opens seal number seven on the seventh sealed scroll, we know exactly what's going to happen the world is going to be liberated. 
because the seventh seal is going to launch the trumpets. And then the seventh trumpet is going to launch the bowls. And as we mentioned before, every time one of these judgments hits the earth, the grip of the devil over this world um, gets weaker. You see that? So that's why this, this seven-sealed scroll in Revelation chapter 5 is such a big deal. Um, it, it, once open, triggers everything else on the chain. And once the chain starts to be triggered, we know exactly what's going to happen. We know that victory is ultimate. And as long as that seven-sealed scroll remains closed, the earth is going to remain in the state of bondage it's in to Satan's grip. You see that? That's why John weeps in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, upon contemplating the fact that no one is worthy to open this, this, the uh, seven-sealed scroll. But then he stops weeping when he recognizes that Jesus is worthy. So what is happening in the book of Revelation is the kingdom is finally coming to the earth. That's the point of the book. Revelation 5 and verse 10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So if you want to know what the point is of the book of Revelation, that's the point. The point is the kingdom is coming to the earth and Satan is being, banned, is being kicked off the earth. And one of the things you want to do when you study a book of the Bible is you want to try to settle on what you think is the key verse of the book. Uh, I think every book of the Bible has a key verse in it that, that tells you what that book is about better than any other verse. And for years and years and years, you know, I struggled really to find that summarizing verse that would summarize the book of Revelation. Uh, for a long time, I've thought the key verse was Revelation 1, verse 7. Why did I think that? Because that's what everybody else told me it was, so I believed him. Revelation 1, 7 is very good, by the way. It says, Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. And those who pierced him and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. <clears throat> so it is to be. Amen. So that talks about the second coming of Christ, and most people would say, well, that verse really is the key verse of the book. But I really don't think that's the key verse. I think the key verse is in Revelation 11, verse 15. It says, the seventh angel sounded, so this is trumpet seven, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Uh, personally, I believe that's the key verse of the book because it summarizes what the book is about, the transfer of earthly authority from the grip of Satan back to the grip of Jesus Christ. And all of these people today that think we're in the kingdom and we're bringing in the kingdom, you can see how silly that is because what this book is telling us is the kingdom is not going to come to the earth until Jesus in heaven starts to open that seven-sealed scroll. Until that happens, there's a, there are chains about this earth under Satan's dominion, you know, as we've talked about. So what then is the goal of history? Uh, you see a typical prophecy chart there. You see the second, you see the tribulation period. First you see the, the church age, then the church age ends with the rapture. Then you have a tri the tribulation period, seven years then Jesus returns, and then right after the second advent of Christ, you see this uh, square there that says kingdom, Revelation 20, specifically verses 1 through 10. That's the goal of history right there. It's the, it's the reclaiming of the title deed to this earth and the reassertion of that authority by God over the earth that was lost in Eden. And guess what, folks? We're part of it. Because according to Revelation 5 and verse 10, what are we going to be doing when we return with Christ at the end of the tribulation period? We're going to reign under his delegated authority. 
So that's our future in God. And the degree of authority that we wield under his delegation, you know, it's not like he needs our help. But he gives us the privilege of exercising authority in his kingdom. And the degree of authority we wield depends on our faithfulness to what God has called us to do now. So we are destined for authority and um, on this earth under Christ's kingdom. And, uh, you know, people aligned themselves with David when Saul was on the throne. And when David finally ascended to the throne, those that had aligned themselves with David when Saul was on the throne were given positions of authority in his kingdom. See that? So we have this unique opportunity to align ourselves with Christ, who I'm, David is a type of Christ, while Saul or Satan is on the throne. See that? But one of these days, Satan is going to be deposed from the throne, and those of us who have aligned ourselves with Christ by faith are given authority in in the kingdom. So you align yourself with David by walking by faith and not sight. Because David was anointed king, wasn't he? 1 Samuel 16 long before he actually took the throne. David is anointed as king while Saul was still governing the nation. So what has happened is Jesus, thanks to his resurrection from the dead, has been anointed as king. But Saul, or Satan, is on the throne, and that's why there's so much in the Bible about we should not walk by sight, but we should walk by faith. If you walk by sight, you just align yourself with Satan or Saul. If you walk by faith, you align yourself with the anointed king that's not there yet, but will be there one day. And to do that requires faith. You see that? So it's, it's a marvelous thing what our future is in God. And that's why Paul is so frustrated with the Corinthians, who are so petty with each other, in 1 Corinthians 6, that they're suing each other, if you can imagine that in discrediting the gospel before unsaved people. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says, don't you know that we're going to judge the angels one day? What is he talking about? He's talking about the authority that we are destined to wield under Christ once he establishes his kingdom.
those thrones. All of us that have aligned ourselves with Jesus Christ by faith in this age. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony and because of the word of God, so we're going we're gonna to be on thrones and here it's talking primarily about tribulation, martyrs will be on these thrones. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Now, you see how we're called priests exercising authority? That's why we are called at the beginning of this book, <clears throat> Revelation 1, 6, God has made us a kingdom of what? Priests. And then Revelation 5, verse 10, which we, I had up on the screen a little earlier, says he has made us into a kingdom of priests and they or we will reign upon the earth. So we're this kingdom of priests but we're not yet reigning because his kingdom is not here because we're living in the devil's world. But it's very clear that we will reign, not up on the clouds, you know. A lot of people have the view of the future that we're just sort of floating on clouds, wearing white sheets with halos, singing the Alleluia chorus 10 billion times, bored to death. And we, we think these things because we don't consult the scripture. The scripture is telling us that yes, we're with the Lord for seven years in the Father's house, but we are actually going to have an, a role as reigning upon the earth under his delegated authority. So this is when our kingdom of priest status is fulfilled during this thousand year kingdom. Then, the then when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now notice that in the kingdom age, Satan only gets out because God allows it. So Satan is under God's thumb during this time. And that's not what's happening today, right? Satan is ruling this, this world. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Now these would be the mortals, uh, mortal descendants of those who survived the tribulation period and began to repopulate the earth. Everybody uh, in the kingdom when it starts is a believer. And there are some that are survivors of the tribulation period. They become, uh, they enter the kingdom in their mortal bodies. And they begin to repopulate the earth. <laughs> and what just got passed down through the bloodline, the sin nature. So they're going to have children. Their children are going to have children. Their children are going to have children. This goes on for about a thousand years. And the earth is repopulated. And there's going to rise a generation that's been living in a perfect environment for a thousand years. And yet they hate Jesus Christ's guts. In fact, there's a prophecy in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, as to, as to the fact that these people will not want to go to Jerusalem to worship Christ. But they're sort of uh, coerced into it because he's ruling with a rod of what? rod of iron. So eventually Jesus let Satan out of his prison called the Abuso or the Abyss and he stimulates a worldwide rebellion very quickly and then the rebellion is immediately judged because this is the kingdom age. This is a time period when anybody that steps out of line is immediately dealt with by God. 
So the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. I mean, how much sand is on the seashore? That's an awful lot, isn't it? And so I think God is allowing this to demonstrate that changing someone's environment does not correct the sin nature problem. See, we live in this society where we're told if we could just fix the environment of people, you know, raise their standard of living, give everybody job security, give everybody a great education, that crime would decrease. Because we don't have a biblical view of man. We don't understand that our depravity starts from where? Our heart. So we think education is going to fix things. Well, guess what happens when you educate a blue-collar thief? He becomes a white-collar thief. And uh, if you want to look at a society that had the highest literacy standards and rates and had more PhDs per capita than any other society that's ever existed, you know which society I'm talking about? I'm talking about Nazi Germany. Because education doesn't fix people on the inside. The gospel fixes people on the inside. So God allows these thousand years to go forward to finally resolve once and for all, at least to us, where evil comes from. It comes from the heart. So Satan is released from his abyss. He stimulates this worldwide rebellion. And look how fast it's crushed because Jesus is reigning from David's throne. They came up on the broad plain and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now, what do you think the beloved city is? Jerusalem, that's the capital. So Satan attacks the headquarters of the whole millennial kingdom. And fire came down from heaven. See how fast the judgment is here? And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where his, his buddies, the beast and the false prophet, now they were, they're thrown in there a thousand years earlier. Revelation 19. Look at what it says here. Where the beast and the false prophet, what? Are also. In other words, they've been in there a thousand years. And that's important because a lot of people are out there teaching that if you're an unbeliever and you die, you just get annihilated. The Jehovah's Witnesses not if, but when they come to your house, believe this. And there are some people, even in the evangelical theological society, like Clark Pinnock and others that teach this. And very clearly here, the souls of the beast and the false prophet didn't just get annihilated. They continued on a thousand years later. And they will be torn, and if that wasn't clear enough, look at what it says here, once Satan is reunited with his buddies in the lake of fire. They will be tormented day and night for how long? Not just forever, but forever and ever. That's the Greek word ionios, two times. Ionios, eternal, is a word used to describe God himself. He's called the eternal God, Romans 16, verse 26. So if God is eternal, if Ionios in Greek means eternal in reference to God, then hell itself has to be forever also. See that? And to get the point across, it doesn't, it doesn't use Ionios once, it uses it twice, translated forever and ever. So this, this is the kingdom. This is the apex of where history is headed. So Satan, do you think he wants the kingdom to come? I don't think so. This chart here gives the sevenfold defeat of Satan. He's not defeated all at once. He's defeated progressively as history unfolds. He's kicked out of heaven. There's all the verses there. You can look them up. He's defeated in Eden when a prophecy is given. That, this, that there's coming one from the seed of the woman who's going to crush his head. His tampering of the pre-flood gene pool to prevent the birth of the Messiah in Genesis 6. He was defeated in that round. The angels involved in that sin are in incarceration. And that's why Jesus, in between his resurrection and, his, and ascension, 
uh, excuse me, crucifixion and resurrection descended to where those fallen angels are involved in that sin and preached victory over them. And you'll see that described in 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. The word there for preached is not the word for evangelism. That's euangelizo, evangelism. This is a totally different verb. It's caruso. He descended to where they were and proclaimed to them victory their attempt to thwart the birth of the Messiah by trying to tamper with the genetics of the human race in Genesis 6, sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim on the earth, all that stuff. It failed. The Messiah has been born. Number four, Satan is defeated at the cross. Now, did you know Satan still has access to heaven? Uh, He can go into heaven not to worship and serve as he once did as a high-ranking angel, but to communicate and to accuse. That's what is happening with Job, right? Early chapters of the book of Job. But halfway through the tribulation period, that privilege is taken away. And he descends to the earth knowing he has but a short time and he tries to devour Israel. I'll explain that in a second. Why is he going after Israel? Because she's the covenanted nation. She's the instrument through which the kingdom will come. See that? Satan believes in preemptive attacks. A preemptive attack is I'm going to take you out before you take me out. He knows the significance of Israel. And his goal has always been to destroy Israel because he knows that the kingdom is going to come through Israel by the covenantal design of God. And then once the kingdom starts, as we just saw, he's going to be bound in the abuso, the abyss, for a thousand years. And then at the end of that kingdom age, he's allowed to kind of go forth and manufacture one more uh, uh, rebellion against God, which is short-lived, and he's judged. Fire comes down from heaven, destroys his rebellion, and he's thrown into the lake of fire. See, so what is Satan trying to prevent? He's trying to prevent this kingdom from coming to the earth. Because once the kingdom comes, he will be bound for a thousand years. And at the end of the kingdom, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. So that's why he is portrayed in the book of Revelation as going after Israel. He knows what God has promised, going back to the time of Abraham, concerning Israel. In you, that's Israel, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isaiah 42, verse 6, says the same thing. Israel is a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6, says the same thing. You are a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So it always has been the plan and program of God to bless the world through Israel. Israel is chosen to be a blessing to the world. And there are three great blessings God purposes to bring to the earth through Israel. The first of the three is the Bible. We understand that, right? If, if God had not strategically worked through the Jewish people, we wouldn't have this book. Every writer of the book, this book, the only one they debate anymore is Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts. Every single writer of this book was Jewish. There's not even a Southern Baptist writer in there. And then the second blessing is the Savior. Jesus was Jewish, right? Jesus in John 4, 22 says salvation is of the Jews. Matthew Matthew 1 traces the genealogy of Christ back to David and back to Abraham. Had God not worked through the Jewish people, we wouldn't have a Savior. And most people think, well, that's all God is going to do through Israel. But as I like to say, Israel is the gift that keeps on giving. Because there's a third blessing yet to come through the Jewish people, the kingdom. Because the kingdom is going to be located where? 
in terms of headquarters. Jerusalem. That's why when Satan is released from his, the abuso or the abyss at the end of the kingdom age, he immediately attacks the beloved city because that's the headquarters of the kingdom. So you can, you can see why Satan has great hatred for the nation of Israel and he continues to be at war with the nation of Israel because he thinks he can stop blessing three from coming to the earth. If he can stop blessing three from coming to the earth, who remains in authority over the earth? The devil does. See that? So this gives us a perspective, if you will, on the great hatred for the Jewish people throughout the earth today. And really throughout the centuries and throughout history. There's an irrational hatred towards the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, it is largely... uh, Uh, satanic because Satan knows the scripture he knows that the kingdom is going to come through Israel and so he seeks to eradicate Israel so the kingdom can never come look at all these blessings we have because of the Jewish people the patriarchs, the law the prophets the Messiah the apostles Uh, the biblical writers, the early church, the early Christian martyrs, Paul the Apostle, the future kingdom. uh, All of this is a reality because of God's work through Israel. Genesis 12, 3, Romans 9, uh, 4 and 5. So, Real quickly, let's go to Revelation 12. And I think Jim or whoever, we can probably turn the air back to normal by now. We only have 10 minutes left, and I, I see people putting on their skiing jackets. And uh, I, I warm up very fast, but I'll survive for 10 minutes. <clears throat> um. Take a look at Revelation 12, verses 1 through 5. I mean, Satan, as the, as the kingdom authority is being transferred, he's not just going to sit there and let it happen. See that? So John writes this, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor pain, to give birth. And another sign was seen in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven horns and ten, ten uh, seven horns and ten, I'm sorry, seven heads and ten horns, there we go, and upon his head seven diadems. And his tail swept a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that he may devour her child and she gave birth to a son a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God in his throne so we have three characters here the son s-o-n the dragon and the woman Who do you think the son is? Jesus. He says he's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That comes right out of Psalm 2, verse 9. He was caught up to God in his throne. That's the ascension. Acts 1, 9. So who do you think the dragon is? The devil, because verse 9, we didn't read it, but verse 9 tells you the dragon is the devil. Who is the woman clothed with the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, you've got to go back to the Old Testament to get that answer. And this is related to Joseph's dream when he was 17 years old. Genesis 37 verse 9 says, Now he still had another dream and related it to his brothers. And he said, lo, I have had still another dream. Behold the sun, S-U-N, and the moon... And the 11 stars, Joseph being the 12th star, were bowing down to me. Does that imagery sound familiar? 
It's right there out of Revelation 12.1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. He related it to his father. That would be Jacob, right? His father rebuked him. And in the process of the rebuke, Jacob, his father, interprets the imagery in Joseph's dream, which John is using in the book of Revelation. See that? He, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream you have had? Sh shall I and your mother, that's the sun and the moon, and your brothers, that's the 11 stars, Joseph being the 12th star, actually come to bow down ourselves down before you to the ground? It's a prophecy about how Joseph would become second in command at age 30 and how Jacob and his sons would come to Egypt from Canaan about Genesis 46, about the year chronologically uh, 1876 roughly BC, looking at Bible chronologies. And come to Joseph, who, through providence, God's providence, was elevated to second in command in Egypt after his brothers sold, it, sold him into Egypt as a slave, left him for dead. That's why Joseph, at the end of the book, to his brothers said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. So God used this evil set of events to rescue Israel in the midst of a famine. Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow ourselves down to you before the ground? So the book of Revelation is not going to give you all this background imagery uh, in terms of the explanation. It assumes we know all this stuff before we approach the book of Revelation. So if you're a good student of the Bible and you see that image in the book of Revelation, uh, you know where it's coming from. You see that? So the sun is Jacob, the moon is Leah, because Rachel's dead by this time, Genesis 35, and Jacob had two wives, right? Not that that's a good thing, uh, not that God is promoting having two wives, but that's how it worked in Jacob's case. The 11 stars would be Joseph's brothers. Who's the 12th star? Joseph, and so who are these 12 stars? The 12 tribes of? Israel, Jacob's sons, Jacob's dozen. So the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars is Israel. So what's happening in Revelation 12 is Satan is standing in front of Israel trying to prevent the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's what we read about on Christmas, Matthew 2, where Herod is... Uh, you know, over insecurity over his own throne is basically trying to kill all of the Bethlehem innocent males. Remember that? The infants, I should say. And then you get to Revelation 12, verse 6, through the end of the chapter, and this is what Satan is doing after he's cast out of heaven. See, verses 1 through 5 is a past strategy that failed. He tried to prevent the birth of Christ, and he failed. So what he is doing after he is cast out of heaven midway through the tribulation period is he's trying to gobble up the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. And who's the woman? Israel. Why is he trying to do that? Because she is the tool that God is using to transfer the authority of this earth from Satan's grip back to God's grip. You see that? She's receiving the offer of the kingdom. So Satan says, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to shut this down right now. This transfer of authority that's happening, I'm going to gobble up Israel, the instrument that God is using. You see that? To transfer the authority. So that's why Revelation 12 is a description of the satanic hatred for Israel. Wrath, persecution, he wants to sweep her away. He's enraged by her. He declares war against her. And you remember what Jesus said 
to Israel in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. It's very clear he's speaking to Israel here. Because he says what? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He says in verse 39, I say to you from now on you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, I'm not coming back to rescue you from the Antichrist until you acknowledge me as the Messiah. See that? So if that's true, if the whole return of Christ and the setting up of the kingdom is contingent upon Israel's response to her Messiah, and that's what the prophecies and the covenants dictate that we've consistently studied all the way through this course, what would you do if you were Satan? You blot out every single Jew on planet Earth. If there's no Jews left on planet Earth, there's no one left to call the Messiah back to the Earth. You see that? You see how Satan's mind is thinking in, a darken, in, his, in its darkened way? And that explains the utter hatred that Satan has towards the woman or Israel. And this whole thing kicks into high gear in the second half of the tribulation period. So what is happening in Revelation 12, 13 through 16 is God two times supernaturally steps in and protects Israel. Just as he wouldn't allow the messianic line to be blotted out leading to Christ. Every attempt by Satan to stop that line, God protected that line and Jesus was born. That's why Jesus proclaimed Caruso victory to the fallen angels that were trying to tamper with the genetics leading to Christ. So just as God supernaturally protected the line leading to Christ, protecting his first coming, God is in these verses supernaturally protecting the woman or Israel so that the kingdom can come to the earth. You see that? Do you see the, do you understand why this transfer of authority that's happening here is invoking spiritual warfare? And through this whole process, what is God doing? He is allowing two-thirds of the Hebrew people to be cut off. The two-thirds unbelievers are being cut off. That's who Satan is uh, killing, I would say, through this spiritual warfare that's going on that reaches its zenith in the second half of the tribulation period and God is actually using Satan's wrath against Israel to purge off the two-thirds unbelievers to retain a one-third of the remnant who are believers. Why is God doing that? Because he's got to fulfill his covenant through Israel, covenants, which is the manifestation of the earthly what? kingdom see I mean if you're the devil I mean you like running the world and you don't like the idea of being deposed we've seen earlier how he's going to be deposed so what he is doing is attacking 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 to keep his grip over this earth um, it, it is the this whole thing is the outworking of Genesis 3 verse 15 which is the first uh, messianic prophecy given in the whole Bible where God says, I will put enmity between... Now, he's talking to the serpent when he says this. I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman here is Eve. Between your seed and her seed. See that? He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, if you had your choice, would you rather have your heel bruised or your head crushed? I'd take the heel bruised, because if your head's crushed, you're defeated. So what, what is predicted here is there's coming this Messiah. Satan along the way is going to be able to inflict a lot of temporary damage. That's the imagery of the bruising of the heel. But ultimately, the Messiah is going to win. Satan's head is going to be crushed, because what will come to the earth? The kingdom, which will result in the binding of Satan for a thousand years, 
And at the end of the thousand years, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. You see that? See how this whole, you see how this verse here unpacks the whole Bible? If, if you miss what's going on here in Genesis 3 verse 15, you can't understand the Bible. Because the whole Bible is an unpacking or an explanation of this verse. If you, if you don't understand the import of this verse, it's like going to a movie and getting there 10 minutes late and missing a key fact in the movie that's introduced early. And you're confused for the whole movie because you missed this key fact at the beginning. See that? That, in essence, is what happens to a lot of Christians because we have our one-year Bible reading programs, right? We've got to rush through everything to keep up our schedule. And so your average Christian, their eyes just glaze right over Genesis 3, verse 15. And consequently, they're lost as to the rest of the Bible. I mean, why does Cain kill Abel in the next chapter? It's an outworking of Genesis 3, verse 15. Uh, Why does Herod kill all of the babies in Bethlehem? It's an outworking of Genesis 3, verse 15. Why is Satan, midway through the tribulation period, going after Israel to gobble her up? It's an outworking of Genesis 3, verse 15. He's working in history to stop God's plan, and yet the prophecy predicts you you can bruise that heel all you want, Satan, but your head is going to be crushed. And God, through tiny Israel, the third that's left, is going to fulfill his covenants in the thousand-year kingdom, resulting in the banishment of Satan from this earth. So this is how the kingdom comes. So we've seen the reoffer of the kingdom, uh, how all of this represents the transfer of earthly authority, And then next week I'll show you exactly what this world is going to be like once the kingdom is established. And then we'll make a few comments about the duration of the kingdom. Because John in Revelation 20 is pretty clear. He says a thousand years six times. And I can't tell you how many evangelicals so-called I run into that say that's not a literal number. And so I'll show you exactly that it is a literal number and God wants us to understand that it's going to be a thousand year kingdom. Anyway, okay, sorry for the technical difficulties and other things, so I'm finished talking. And uh, if folks need to go pick up their kids or whatever else, free to go. And uh, we could open up for Q&A if you guys want to do that.